All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And hopefully that'll work. Technology, it's always a surprise. What works, what doesn't I know. work. I know. I think, I think we're good. <laughs> I hope we're good. It's been a pretty exciting time in the wine business for that because I've learned how to do all sorts of different things virtually. So uh, as much as I don't love talking to people on screens all day, and I would much rather be sitting in front of all of you at Everything Wine, um, it has opened up some pretty exciting possibilities. I've worked on all sides of the wine business. So um, I can talk to people in Italy. I can talk to people in France. I can talk to all of you. It's pretty cool. It's pretty, exactly. One, one good thing out of COVID has definitely been the the uh, getting used to or familiar with technology, right? So I, I found the same thing. So that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Um, whoops, that's weird. Sorry. All good. We're coming back. <laughs> so, anyways, we're going to kick off. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Happy Friday. I uh, hope you've all had good weeks. My name is Sandhya Suryam, and I'm the Director of Marketing for Everything Wine, and I'll be emceeing the event for tonight. We're very proud to support One Girl Can, an organization that invests in mentorship and education with university scholarships for young women in Africa. And through our partnership with the purchase of every tasting bundle, $5 was graciously donated by Joie Farm Winery to One Girl Can. And we threw in a little discount in there as well to help everyone with the purchase. Um, you've probably already heard us prattle on and have a little bit of conversation if you jumped on here early, but if you have any questions, please add them to the comments on the right hand side of the chat and we'll try to get to them at the end. Um, Johnny Smart with our organization is helping field those as well, so if you see her reply to anything, you know who she is. If you're having any trouble with the streaming or video issues, I just suggest turning your video off so we get a good experience um, and make sure your mic is on mute. I had to practicing that five or six times because it was a tongue twister for me <laughs> and I'd also like to recommend next to our speakers next to their name you'll see three horizontal dots if you click on that there's an option to pin them so you can pin your speakers to the front of the screen so they're always front and center for you um, this tasting is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel afterwards which is called everything wine experts and with that, I'll turn it over to Heidi Noble, the owner and executive winemaker from Joie Farm Winery. And a last minute change, but we're ever so grateful to have her, Melanie Allen, our wine consultant from Everything Wine. Great. Thanks, Sandia. So um, I think, Heidi, did you want to speak a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself first, and then uh, I'll tell, say a little bit about myself. So. Yeah, you bet. Um, thank you everybody for coming. I'm, I'm Heidi. Um, I'm the owner and the winemaker at Joie Farm Winery. For those of you that aren't familiar with Joie and just uh, checked out these cans as a curiosity, Joie is located in, on the Naramata Bench in the beautiful Okanagan Valley um, here in British Columbia. Uh, Joie has been around since 2004. I moved to the Okanagan from Vancouver um, in the early 2000s. My background is culinary. I'm a trained chef uh, by trade. Um, also crit philosopher, critical thinker. I have a varied background, but I came into wine um, from the kitchen side. Um, I have a SOM designation as well. I had worked 10 years professionally in the kitchen before I decided to move into the wine side um, of food and wine. Um, I still wanted to be very much involved with the restaurant world, but needed out of the kitchen. Um, with my SOM designation, I worked on the wine import side of the business. I worked for a small agency called Seco for four years. I was very privileged to be able to travel uh, around the world um, with my with my wine job, uh, meeting different winemakers, different winery owners, and it was a real integral part of starting Joie. Um, I have a little bit of a a backwards entry into making wine. Most people uh, learn hard skills first. They either go to enology school or grow up with that in their family. I did neither of those things. Because I did have a culinary background and formal wine training, I had a very trained palate, um, which I think is something you have to develop and can't really, you, you can start uh, with an education, but you really have to develop a palate over time and then learn my hard skills after the fact through apprenticeships. I didn't go to wine school because at that point in my life, um, you know, I was in my 
I was in my early 30s, I, I had two university degrees, I had a Red Seal chef designation, I had a SOM designation, it was time to stop learning and it was time for doing. Um, so yeah, my my story is is atypical, but I think it really informed um, how Ishwa came to be. Awesome, great, thanks. I, well, well, difficult to follow that introduction, <laughs> but... Um... <laughs> Um, I'm Melanie Yall and I am a sommelier as well um, and I do work for Everything Wine um, but I also do my own um, private and corporate tastings um, in Vancouver in the Lower Mainland so and you can follow me on my Instagram page at The Traveling Cork if you're uh, interested in that at all um, but yes yeah, so uh, as uh, Sandia said I'm kind of a last minute uh, substitute so I'm really happy to be here and really happy to meet Heidi so um, so nice to meet you Heidi um, anyway so I have a couple of questions for you and kind of in, in light of um, um, International Women's Day as well, really wanting to spotlight women in wine and and what it's like for the women in the wine world and, and uh, the wine journey for women. So I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about um, how you decided to actually become the winemaker that you are and sort of the philosophy of joie um, and any kind of challenges um, that you've experienced getting into the wine world and just making actually making wine, being a winemaker, female winemaker. Sure. Um, because I came out of the culinary world as a chef, um, I think that was a bit atypical to be female in the late 80s and early 90s in kitchens. Um, I certainly came up in that old school version of that that still had a lot of um, uh, very physical... Um, uh, you know, people didn't treat each other very nicely uh, in kitchens and... Um, that was still very much a, a thing when I came up through kitchens. Now, I was a pretty dedicated young cook. That didn't really bother me, really. It was just part of what was happening at that time. Um, but I think um, it was more the culinary side than in... I think I was just used to being the only female around and I've worked with men my whole life. I've literally worked with brigades of dudes my whole life. Uh, you know, uh, my first, my first cooking job was when I was 14. Um, it was for a catering company in Edmonton. I was raised by, by gay men in the catering business. Um, I worked in kitchens with men all the time. And then when I made wine, uh, also, the wine, the international wine trade is pretty male dominated as well. Um, and then learning how to make wine again, we all see wine as a very glamorous lifestyle -y thing, but in its essence, it's very much the hardcore agriculture, farming, heavy equipment. I mean, I own four tractors, two forklifts, a quad. You know, um, I get excited about when I see a winch passing on the highway on the back of somebody's truck. I don't know. I, I cross both spectrums of that and um, I'm comfortable in, in, in both worlds and certainly identify with the strength that it takes to work in agriculture and in kitchens and in, in industrial um, environments. Um, I think that has brought me up to just be a tough a tough grown ass lady. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> perfect. Still, exactly. We want to highlight on International also, Women's Day. For, so it's great. Just, for anybody listening today, I have a mouth like a trucker, which is also a condition of working in kitchens and working <laughs> with your whole life. So, you know, I grew up in a school of, of pretty hard knocks, but I think that informed a really um, rugged resilience, but from a female perspective. So I'm really glad, I also grew up in a family of brothers. I don't have a sister, so. Yeah. Um, I think I think that served me well. And quite frankly, I was never, I've, well, we can get into the awesome real Hollywood stories, I promise, but um, I never found myself in a situation that I couldn't handle myself, or if I did, I was never, put in a situation where I, I didn't feel empowered to ask for help or anything like that. So I do feel lucky in that regard. I know many women who that is not the case for. Um, but one of the reasons that I got out of the kitchen and wanted to work in the wine business is it just seemed so much more human and so much more civilized. The wine business, the wine trade internationally is like a big family. Um, I really loved that about it. Yet, 
if you know any cooks in your life, if, you know, once a line cook, always a line cook. So um, I never wanted to leave my restaurant past behind. And one of the reasons that, well, it is the reason that Joie is called Joie is I very much wanted the joy of food and wine and restaurant life to continue in my life, but on a different, in a different way and in, in a different form. And because I came out of the wine trade, the wines that I made were very much for my restaurant friends. Joie was, a whole, Joie didn't have a tasting room. Joie started as an on-farm cooking school. My ex-husband and I, uh, Michael Dinn, started Joie in 2003. And Michael and I were an ex-cook and waiter in essence. Yes, we worked in the wine business for four years, but we came into the wine business with, you know, hundreds of dollars, not hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, which is very, very much necessary in the wine business. Making wine is incredibly capitally intense. Um, so our circumstance was un 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 unlikely um, from, from so many perspectives. But what made Joie unique, to answer your question, is that that restaurant history and that culinary history really informed what we made um, in those very first vintages of Joie. Now, because we didn't have enough money to have a winery right away, we barely had enough money for a down payment on the farm. Um, we started Joie as an on-farm cooking school and um, held long table dinners on the farm for four, four seasons before um, the winer we built our own winery building. So in amongst doing, all, which really created a nice, you know, culty aura around what we were doing. It definitely had a food element to it. Um, we were both trained psalms, so we, wine for us was very much, part, not just a beverage, but very much part of the table. Um, so I think Juan is essence is always um, a port, has been a portfolio that has been for the table in very food oriented wines. Absolutely. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks, Heidi. Well, as we jump into the wines now and uh, go through the tasting and everybody, we're starting with the um, Noble Blend first. Um, as we get into it, maybe you could also just answer a quick question of how you decided to or what inspired you, I guess, to um, to move into the canned format. Yeah, they're beautiful. They're so cute. And the design's great. It's like <laughs> perfectly fits into a little purse wherever you go. So. It actually does fit <laughs> into this purse. It fits into all sorts of golf bags, white panniers, um, all the things. These were the perfect COVID format. Um, this was a hard leap, but not a hard leap for me. Um, I'm going to talk about the Noble Blend first, and then we can talk about the format. But the Noble Blend um was the very first wine um that we made the first vintage of schwa was made in 2004 it was a tiny vintage made from rented space in friends wineries um we did three vintages like that until we um built uh, our own winery building tore down our orchard built our own vineyard site um but we made three three wines in 2004 uh, the first one being the noble blend the rosé and the Anouk Chardonnay. And all three of these wines were very much made for the restaurant market in Vancouver. The Noble Blend, I did not make up. Um, the Noble part of it is meant to be a pun. This is um, based on a classic Alsatian um, blending tradition that's 800 years old. So Alsace is the German um, part of France, where France sort of meets Germany on the very eastern edge of France. I'm going to open this. Um, Love that so, sound. <laughs> um, in Alsace, a uh, wine like this is um, controlled by French winemaking law. It's a country wine, Edelsvicker. Its colloquial name is Gentil, meaning for the for the gen for the gentry. Um, it's meant to be a wine stube wine you just have with like a, a tart flambe, a very simple like bistro meal or bar snack in Alsace. And by French winemaking law, um, an Edelsvicker, which translates literally from German to English as a noble blend, um, that's literally what it means. It's not named after me. That's just meant to be um, cute. Um, uh, in that part of the world, an Edelsvicker is classically, uh, has to be the five noble varieties of Alsace, which are um, Gewürztraminer, Riesling, Pinot Blanc, or Pinot Gris, um, Pinot Auxerrois, and Muscat. So the Noble Blend has always been those five varieties. It's never been a random mix, like a conundrum-esque mix of Chardonnay, any of those things have never gone in there. 
because I was a young uh, New World winemaker, I really looked to the old world for reference points. Um, I thought it was really important to learn how to walk before you run. You learned how to run. I was a French trained chef by training. Those those old world things were really ingrained in me um, to respect and almost not even to question. That was part of your your old school, you know dude question of, of Laura, that's how we were trained. You just didn't ask those questions. You just respected those traditions. And as much as whatever you think of that philosophy, I think that they're very important because those tradition and in particular blending traditions in Europe are so longstanding. And there's a lot of wisdom and natural balance in to me as a, a psalm and an enjoyer of, of wines for the table in that natural balance. So the five noble varieties of Alsace the Gewürztraminer brings the spice. Gewürz in German means spicy. The Riesling brings the mouthwatering and acidity. The Pinot Blanc or the Pinot Auxerrois brings that nice mouth-filling body to the wine. And often for me, Pinot Auxerrois really brings that typically Alsatian coriander or nutmeg flavor. And the Muscat kind of brings the white flowers. So I did not make this blend up. This is like a clever New World iteration of the Noble Blend. So that's the first part of the Noble Blend story. The second part of the Noble Blend story is this is a wine that was made for restaurants. And this was in the early 2000s in Vancouver. This is the era of bin 941, 942. Everybody stopped fine dining and everybody started casually dining. Everybody stopped having their own entree. And everybody had shared plates of tapas. And as a server, as a psalm, you really had to have a wine that had a lot of gears to pair with many different things at a table. So if you're a server and you had a four top and somebody was having fish and something, somebody was having something Asian influenced, which was very um, frequent in the early 2000s in Vancouver, um, with all the many different um, cuisines that influence, I think, West Coast uh cuisine right we have a huge a huge chinese population in richmond we have a huge persian community there's just there's just so many influences on all that ingredient driven food um in vancouver the wines that were hot in the early 2000s in vancouver were like um uh vina esmeralda torres's vina esmeralda and classically hugel Gentil, which was an alsatian um, Adel's Vicar. Um, so that was a need in the market. Um, but further to that, when we first got to the Okanagan, any we we had to buy grapes because we didn't have our own grapes. Yeah, I still buy a lot of grapes. You have to be very wealthy uh, to own all your own vineyard land in the Okanagan. But we wanted to buy grapes that were mature and had a lot of age on them. And the things that had a lot of age on them in the early 2000s in the Okanagan were the very first things that were planted in the Okanagan um, that were real winemaking vinifera grapes. And those were planted by Germans and they just in, imported by Germans and they just happened to be um, Gewürztraminer, Pinot Blanc and Riesling. So we were able, and everybody was ripping out those varieties in the early 2000s in the pursuit of planting big reds, which I thought was, atrocious, right? These vines were just coming into full maturity. They were planted in the late 70s and had the privilege to buy some pretty old vineyard sites in the Okanagan. So most of the Gewürztraminer and the Riesling in the Okanagan in the Noble Blend are over 30 or 40 years old. So um, that real depth of flavor in the Noble Blend has always come from the age of those vines, which is amazing. Um, and it's part of the actual history of uh, proper vinifera, proper winemaking grapes in the Okanagan, the very first things planted there. So it was this happy three-way circumstance of looking to the old world and the new world as a young winemaker, making wine for my restaurant friends for things that they needed. Um, for example, Vikram Vige uh, was the very first buyer of the Noble Blend. God bless you, Vikram or Miru, if you're listening. Vikram put down his credit card on the table and he said, Heidi, I trust you. We did our psalm together in 1999 at De He said, Heidi, I trust you. I know what you're going to make. Well, I think his words were, it isn't going to suck. <laughs> and he half of the first vintage of the blend in 2004 and sold it through Vigas. So 
Vitas was this vector out into the world and all the servers, those beautiful humans who who still put my wine out into the world. That's how Vancouver, you know, the Noble Blend kind of became the well-known wine that it is today. And it was it was my restaurant friends that did that. God bless you all. You built my winery for me. Um, but it was and and then that history of the Okanagan. So um, there's a lot of history to the Noble Blend. And again, I think it's so t- I, I wish I had, you know, a dollar for every time every somebody said to me, I don't drink white wine, but I love your Noble Blend. And what I think they're getting at is that the Noble Blend is naturally what I call tasty. And I think that tastiness is that natural balance that those five noble varieties of Alsace bring to this. Yeah. Well, and I think, and I think too, um, as you were saying, and I actually remember drinking uh, joie at VG's with the lamb popsicles. And I remember thinking, and, yes. and um, they had recommended that to me. And I remember thinking, well, shouldn't I have red wine with lamb? But, and then it was fabulous. So I think that's another thing too, is that it, like you said, it is so diverse and such a good food wine and can, can pair with anything. And so sometimes you almost feel like you're not drinking a white wine. So it's, it's full and it's got so many flavor. The flavor pro- profile is so intense kind of, so. Thank you. Again, I didn't make that up, but those old world blending traditions taught me so much about winemaking in its essence. And going back to, um, if you want to talk about terroir for a minute, you know, the people in a place influencing the way that a wine is made, but also a place influencing the way that people eat and drink. And in its modern context, what happened at, at, at Viges all those years ago is a great example of, of a maturing, the terror, to me terroir also isn't just rocks and rain and geography and all of those things. It has a human cultural component. And me making a wine as a maker into a market influenced the way that people enjoyed that wine and what was being served in those restaurants influenced me as a winemaker and because I continued to sell my own wine and I still do, I still do all my own sales calls. Um, You know, I got to bring all that restaurant feedback to my own winery within the same vintage for, this will be our our 18th vintage at Chua. So that's like, that's like uh, terroir in action, right? Like it's just this in, or a maturation of a cuisine. Cuisine has a human element to it too. And, um, I'm also a graduate of this Stratford Chef School, and the thing that they sent us out into the world, every single graduate of Stratford, has always been our contribution we were asked to make to our industry is trying to define Canadian cuisine through our careers. And I've actively cooked in many wonderful restaurants across the country, from Tuckey to working with Jamie Kennedy and Ann Yurimovich and in Vancouver. Um, but on the wine side of things, this was a really interesting reversal, reverse role of that, right? I got to make wine for a maturing West Coast cuisine in sort of its embryonic stages. And it to watch that cuisine go back and forth over 20 years is, I've been really proud to actively participate in that. Not just influence, but take, take that feedback back and forth to the winery and the vineyard and all of those things. So the next wine in your package, yes. also a really good example of that, because as flexible as and mouthwatering and well balanced as Riesling is, um, Rosé is also one of the most versatile food and wine pairings there is to go with so many things. Um, when I first started making rosé and joie became known for its rosé really early on because there wasn't a lot of rosé in the market i knew that because i worked on the import side of the business and the only rosé in the market at the time was good european um southern french rosé and good tavel was a good 30 bucks 20 years ago uh it was spec meaning it was only available to licensees you know human normal normal people couldn't really buy it unless they went to the store and bought it and it would always arrive in December and July instead of July. So it was this very precious thing to have good dry European rosé 20 years ago in BC. There was a huge hole in the market for it. But also that 
cuisine that I just described, that food culture in Vancouver, and the way that people were eating and living, totally demanded rosé. So Joie's portfolio had rosé in it from day one. We made 80 cases in 2004. <laughs> they sold out in a week. Um, the next year, we went from 80 cases to um, 1,200 cases. Wow. They also sold out in a couple weeks. Um, and then it just went from there. Um, huh. And now many, when I first got up here, people were like, who are these kids from the city making blush? <laughs> Actually happened. And uh, now most wineries in BC make rosé because it's become a part of the way that we live and eat and recreate and relax in British Columbia. So super happy to contribute to that. So my rosé was always um, Pinot Noir and Gamay. I work with those red varieties. So Chua does make red wine. Um, and it's, I've always focused on Pinot and Gamay. Um, I love Burgundy, but I also think um, Burgundian varietals being Pinot Noir, Rosé and Chardonnay thrive in British Columbia's terroir. But they also suit the way that we live and eat. You know, BC cuisine doesn't have a whole lot of call for big... Um, Meritage blends. I mean, I love big wines as much as the rest of us, but I think West Coast cuisine, all our seafood, salmon, coastal mushrooms, ingredient-driven cuisine deserves sort of mid-weight, juicy red wines, not big tannic monsters. I mean, I like a big tannic monster every now and then too, but um, so for rosé, I wasn't after those high alcohol French, you know, Grenache based wines that were often 13, 14% alcohol. I wanted a more moderate, the, my and it, original rosé was inspired by more Loire driven rosé in France, which, um, the red grapes there were Pinot Noir and Gamay, that sort of Anjou bowl of strawberry juiciness. So mm -hmm. I've also always made the rosé I make in the largest quantity in the Joie portfolio. It takes the most time to make. It makes the most mess and it's my lowest price wine. Um, so making good rosé is a dedication in the practice of winemaking. It has a lot of steps. I master it. So when you make rosé, you have to take, you know, the stalks off. It's, it's a, a red wine made like a white wine. So it's like a hybrid of those two winemaking techniques. You, you, you crush grapes, you macerate them, skins to juice. Through that maceration, I love that skin contact is all the rage right now, but I've been skin contacting, <laughs> skin contacting grapes my whole Whatever. career. Um, you with skin contact grape skins to juice. I always did it for a long time. Joie Rosé has always been a deep, intense color because sometimes depending on the temperature of our harvest, um, those grapes would soak for two or three days. And then the key here is to press those grapes off of the skin and you get a, a depth of flavor, but you also get a fine skin tannin. Um, and that gives uh, Joie Rosé another sort of third gear of food and wine pairing. You've got we call it juicidity at Schwa. You've got an intense core of ripe fruit, which I think is the hallmark of the Okanagan. We have big diurnal swings here in the Okanagan during our harvest period and a really long hang time, meaning the acidity, uh, we got warm days, cool nights. So the warm days ripens the fruit slowly, and then the cool nights preserve acidity. So you get this like, elect it's like squeezing lemon juice on strawberries. You get this like electrified fruit and then if you have a little bit of fine tan in there, you have some sophistication, but you also have a rosé that can pretty much pair with anything from, you know, raw, raw prawn, spot prawn ceviche to like steak fruit. You know, there's a lot of latitude in there. It'll pretty, if again, going back to that server analogy, it will pair with anything at a table quite happily. Yeah, absolutely. Juicy. Yeah. And I love whenever I try this one, I've been trying it ever or drinking it ever since you made it. So, um, but whenever I smell it and I taste it and that yeah, beautiful mouthful and that puckering acid, that juicidity, like you talk about, I just think, oh my God, summer is, is here. Even if I'm drinking it in, in January, <laughs> it just feels so, yeah, I really, really enjoy it. It's funny that, um, you know, now the market's exploding with rosés, right? But you're right, for such a, a long time, people did equate rosé with, yeah, you know, paint, uh, white Zinfandel and blush and that kind of thing. And and now we can't get enough rosé in the store to, to keep up. On holiday in the south of France or in, mm. you know, the Caribbean on holiday. Um, but, 
you know, it's it's such an appropriate thing. I always have a bottle of rosé in my fridge. It's like, oh, what do I want to drink tonight? It's usually a bottle of Riesling or it's a bottle of rosé because it's just so flexible. Yeah, exactly. That versatility for sure. And it is, it is like, I love that, uh, that analogy or that picture, that vision of squeezing lemon on like ripe, ready strawberries. So absolutely. That is, that's exactly it. So do you go one step further than that? Like I make this wine in the vineyard. So this is very much a wine where I'll, I'll tree a, I'm a big, um, picker of grapes at multiple times for multiple different reasons. So I'll do an early pick for low, um, low alcohol and acidity. I'll do a sort of a medium pick for, for ripe fruit. And then you go back for a third time. So you get really, really phenolically flavor developed fruit and tannin. Okay. And then you get this beautiful, that's how you get the juicidity. You get the intensity in the ripe core of fruit, but you also get the mouth watering acid. So you can have, I think now that is the hallmark of a chef that makes wine, right? Like I make wine like I cook. And that analogy of uh, lemon juice on strawberries is something I used to teach my my cooking school students, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Whether you're making a a sweet dish or if you're balancing, we used to make a fresh pea soup in the cooking school. It would have fresh herbs in it. I don't know if there's anybody in the audience that ever came to Joie to learn how to cook. Um, but we would make this fresh pea soup and I would teach them how to season at the end. And the first thing we would do was add salt and then the pea flavor would be developed more. And then you would squeeze lemon juice and a little bit of rice wine vinegar, very West coast thing to do. Uh, and then the whole thing was just, sorry for the spinal tap analogy, but like turned up to 11, right? Like, it's like, Um, and to see the lights go on in people's faces that's what natural balance is in wine or in food but in food it wasn't you know you don't talk about it like that that's why i love learning how to make wine after i cooked in cooking that's just rote technique where in the wine world wine geeks love to hyper articulate everything so learning how to make wine really informed me fully understanding the techniques that i used as a chef that i always knew but never really questioned why. Winemaking is all about the why. So I think that's why the Joie portfolio has always been so approachable and consistent. And I don't think those are bad things. I get flack from wine geeks all the time, but fine. Um, <laughs> that's actually, a, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill. And I really do that in the vineyard. This is, it's a matter of timing for me. And I make these wines in my, in my head right even just by looking at the grapes during harvest i could see that change and you observe and you taste and you taste and you're like now go pick and then you do this thing so wow that's incredible and uh, and i can't believe you've been making wine for 18 years already it just uh seems impossible so but just uh, just before we move on there was a great question about what does skin contact mean so it seems relevant to talk about during rosé Sure. So whether you're making white or red wine, um, you have to take the stems off of grapes um, and um, it's called destemming. And then you have an option to crush grapes. Um, You could either ferment them whole berry or crush them. But if you do crush them, um, you have the option of macerating them if you're making a white wine for extra flavor. And in red wine, you actually, so white wine, you would do a process like that, or rosé, you do it for a couple days, excuse me, and then press uh, the grapes. You, I dump by gravity into my press, and then I use a pneumatic press to very gently press off these grapes. Um, and then that, it's called must, that grape must is settled and then fermented. Red wine, um, you ferment on the skins. So that's the difference between red and white wine for people that didn't know. Um, and rosé is a fascinating hybrid because you go through that maceration process of red wine and then you press off the skins like a, a white wine if you're into serious rosé. There's other ways of making rosé like a saigne method, which is a byproduct of making more intense red wine. You drain a tank, away, the juice away from the skins. Um, but I always think this method of pressing off uh, skin, macerated skins from rosé is a wonderful way to achieve all of those things, to highlight an intense core of ripe fruit, to get a little bit of soft skin tannin. Um, yeah, that's what skin contact is. It's literally like if you were making, 
say you had, we'll use the strawberry analogy again, since we're talking about rosé. If you, especially this time of year, you buy unripe strawberries and they look really good. And then you bite one, you're like, eh, these strawberries could be better. When you sprinkle sugar over strawberries, that's macerating them because they break down and the skin, then their skins can touch their juice and it just draws all the flavor out of the strawberry. Uh, macerating grapes is pretty much the same process. Most flavor compounds in all fruit, whether it's grapes or strawberries or all the things, is found in their skin. So macerating is a way to extract those um, flavors out of skin. And that's what skin contact is all about. Great. Thank you, Heidi. Um, awesome. So did you want to move? I haven't tried the bubbles yet. Um, did you want to move on to the bubbles? And is this a, is this a relative? This is a new um, product for you, isn't it? Yes. Awesome. Fun. This is okay. actually bottled. So this is a fun project for me. 20, you know, 20 years into your winemaking career. This is a wine I made for this can format. And this is a true story. Here's here's my first true Hollywood story. I have an, uh, a 10 year old son. His name is Theodore. He's a big part of the winery. He has been a strap on baby since day one. This kid could make the whole Zwaf portfolio. But last year when I made the Noble Blend, he was like, mommy, this is good. It totally tastes like Noble Blend. And then he looked at me with eye contact. He's like, mommy, do you know that people's expectation, he used the word expectation, which was awesome. People's expectation of something out of a can is that it would have bubbles. And I'm like, oh shit, this kid is right. <laughs> <laughs> this is a smart kid. Michael and T, because Theodore is a big name for little guy. Um, I was like, okay, I'm glad you think this tastes like Noble Blend, but I'm going to think about that. So I thought about it all year. I had the opportunity to take on a beautiful new grape contract in Oliver, which had both Sauvignon Blanc and Viognier in it. And I knew I wanted to make a sparkling wine in a can this year. I was like, oh, this is perfect. So I picked the Sauvignon Blanc early. So this can was not 14% alcohol. It's a really easy 11.7. That trie picking that I was talking about for an alcohol pick. And then I let the Viognier get super ripe. So the Sauvignon Blanc has like beautiful sort of gooseberry, fresh limey aromatics. And the Viognier, typical varietal character of Viognier is ripe pineapples. And I'm like, I want to make a Mai Tai in a can, but wine. And I'm a big, I'm a big classic cocktail lover. My partner is a really great bartender. I do love classic Mai Tai, not a shitty one, but a good one. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, I'm I had, I do have experience making barrel fermented Viognier. And if you do a good job, it often tastes like apricot kernels. And when it ferments, it smells like pineapples. I'm like, Okay, I'm gonna take. I'm. This is my goal in my head. So, I did sort of that winemaking. Making wine is like a choose your own adventure novel. There's so many choices to come to an end result. So I kind of did that backwards in my head. I'm like, I want something aromatic and fresh, low test alcohol, and like really voluptuous pineapple that's still fresh. So I picked the stove early. I let the Viognier get super ripe. Um, I use uh, selected yeast strains to show certain things in those varietals, which is really cool to talk about in the beer world, but less so in the wine world, but it's very much a part of winemaking and made tiny bubbles. I called it tiny bubbles because it actually did turn in, turn out to taste like a Mai Tai. And if anybody's into tiki culture, you know, Don Ho and tiny bubbles. So oh, exactly. Oh, wow. I see the comments coming up. Yes. Pineapple, pineapple. Amazing. Oh my God. This is so delicious. It is. It is like, wow. Pineapple. It just blows right out of the can. This is oh, it's beautiful and fresh. Of this is, it's really interesting is again, if there's any classic cocktail geeks out there, Proper Mai Tais and all tiki drinks have this like fresh nutmeg, often have fresh nutmeg in them. And that early pick stove really gave me like a, a high ester of nutmeg and lime. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> yes, you did. Wow, this is incredible. Super easy drinking. Ladies, these are danger because um, as we were speaking before we started this, these cans are 250 mils which means they are a third of a bottle of wine. So when you take down a really cold, easy drinking, tiny bubbles, you are indeed drinking a third of a bottle of wine. <laughs> um, so actually, uh, this turned out great. I think these are like super COVID friendly. These are great for patios. Um, these are really lovely if you live on your own or you have a partner that doesn't drink or it, literally you just want a little nip of something for before dinner. 
Uh, if you're a dedicated day drinker, these, you know, aren't going to, you know, mess with your program too much. Uh, so these are, yeah, this is my newest creation. It, it totally turned out. So I love it. And, and this was just for the can. And maybe this is a nice opportunity to talk about premium, new premium formats and cans. Sure. I just wanted to mention, though, before we move on, do move on to that, because I'm curious about um, more about that. But this is perfect and perfect timing now that we can gather safely with 10 people outside, still keeping our distance. <laughs> but and so many parks now, especially in North Van, you can bring your alcohol. So we were talking about how this fits perfectly in a little purse or your little, you know, backpack or um, um, bike bag, your your bike bag. Um, I bike a lot, so that would be perfect. Um, but perfect, perfect. Your car. <laughs> yes, just don't drive your car. Exactly. Walk to the park, take your bike, <laughs> don't drive your car. Um, and do remember, you're right, this is a, it uh, packs a punch if you have two or three. Um, but yeah, so perfect timing. This is, um, oh, this just feels like summer in a glass. It's amazing. So yeah, that's what I intended. So um, yeah. it was a really good experiment. Um, these cans have exceeded my expectations. I really, I was curious about them because again, we were talking earlier, there's a there's a glass shortage in the world and now there's a container shortage. So we may see in the, the wine business itself, a turn to other formats in general, but people especially dyed in the world wine geeks are gonna have to reconcile that does premium wine go in a more casual format and quite, Frankly, I don't see what is wrong with that. And COVID's really sort of crystallized that thought. It's, well, now we have to go outside. One of the only ways we can socialize is through that. And I think even from a technical perspective, I'm an aromatic white wine maker for the most part and a Pinot maker. So I work in the area of uh, really aromatic wine, high esters. And this format, the way that you can beer or you can wine, is the wine goes into the can, the lid drops, it gets a nitrogen, like a liquid nitrogen, tiny little pellet, and that uh, protects the wine. The lid goes on, it seats and a uh, seamer seams it. But the nitrogen dose actually takes the, they're called um, primary esters and drive it, just the, the aromatics of the wine get driven back into the wine. So when you crack the can, I'm actually thinking that the Novo Blend 2020 tastes better out of the can than it does in the bottle because it delivers all that like guava and aromatics or in tiny bubbles, you get like a face full of pineapple. Like who doesn't want that? And if you're an aromatic white wine drinker, isn't that the point of aromatic white wine? So I would say <laughs> by that logic, these this format, it doesn't taste tinny. These liners are holding up. They're super fun, super convenient. Um, they're from an environmental perspective, they are far less of an impact than glass by weight for transport. They really are less of a carbon imprint. I love that idea. Um, they, I just packaged them in these fun little variety packs. So from like a, a wine business marketing perspective, there's lots of latitude there for both retailers and um, producers and they're just fun and yeah I'm a trained chef and a trained psalm and a serious eater and a serious traveler but you know I have a deep wine cellar myself full of gross, gross burgundy but like yeah I'll drink wine out of a can <laughs> yeah absolutely I know I I am I am I am not uh, I'm not a snob when it comes to good wine so in a can or otherwise that's exactly Again, as long as it's delivering mm -hmm. as, as it should be, and I think it's doing that, but it's actually exceeding my expectations as a winemaker. I had low expectations and last year summer when I did this. I was like, wow, this this is this worked. And then all the canceled in seven days. I'm like, oh, I think this might be a thing. Yeah. So we, I, we couldn't keep them in the store last summer. Everybody kept asking, oh, where's those, that joie in a can? I'm like, sorry, it's gone. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, no, very popular and, and these premium yeah. formats are whether it is a premium bag in the box, whether it's a can, whether it's wine on tap. We were talking about that earlier. I've been kegging wine for 10 years because I love that tradition of a wine stubo. Like what's wrong with coming and having sitting in your local, having a snack and having a drink. Mm -hmm. And um, that's in those hundred year old, hundreds of year old European, excuse me, tradition. So 
Exactly. Um, I, I think we need to lose some of our snobbery around that. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Heidi. These wines are fabulous. And I know we have um, a few questions. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can get to some of the questions, um, Johnny or Sandea. Uh, Oops. I'm really? No, I Absolutely. Don't. Just give me a second here. Um, so great questions. Thank you, Heidi and Melanie. This was awesome. Um, so one of the questions that came up was, um, how do you keep the consistency of wine if you're having to buy the grapes many years in advance and assumption is that you are having to do that? Yeah, so I'm a hands-on winemaker, but I'm also hands-on. Uh, viticulture is very much part of what I do. People are like, well, what do you do when you're not making wine? Um, I manage 70 acres of grapes, which I religiously, I cycle through my vineyard sites and I walk and I walk and I look and I walk and I look and I walk. And um, I'm, inst I'm instructing my vineyard team to do certain viticultural movements at certain times. I'm a big fan of being reactive to the vintage. You don't just do things at certain times during a viticultural cycle, I'm, all vintages are different. You have to do things at certain times. So observation is probably the biggest component of viticulture for me. So um, that's how I keep that consistent and actually probably more consistent even sometimes than single vineyard sites because I have the latitude and the agricultural risk is spread out between sites. It's very likely that hail, locusts, um, rainstorm are going to strike um, more than uh, just one particular single vineyard site. I can actually, within a vintage, if something does get damaged or something is riper than another site, I'm a huge blender. Again, I think that comes from my culinary uh, background um, to achieve natural balance. I think it's my biggest pursuit in winemaking is natural balance. That is what consistency is all about. So I actually think purchasing contract, and none of my fruit is contract. These are all long-term contracts for me. I lease a lot of land in lieu of being uh, a wealthy uh, land baroness, which I am not, um, which was very successful. I cannot own um, 70 acres of land in the Okanagan at, you know, $300,000 an acre. It's 20 million bucks worth of wow. ladies. Um, so uh, I actually think it's an advantage, not just from a blending and consistency perspective, but from a terroir perspective, because I've been a fruit buyer um, and a quality fruit buyer for so long. I've actually, this has come up in seminars with Reese Pender. If anybody's a Reese Pender fan, he's like, I moderated a, a seminar with him a couple of years ago at the Pinot Festival. And he's like, Heidi, you know, this question of terror, it was a, a seminar on terroir and real talk. I've probably bought more tonnage than other winemakers over the course of 18 vintages. I've seen how you know, these aromatic varietals in Pinot and Gamay perform north to south all over the Okanagan, whether you're west facing in aromatic, east facing in Summerland as far north as Vernon, you know, all that specific terroir, we're still very, you know, were 30, I guess 40 years old at this point, pretty new in terms of new world viticulture. We don't know what grows well where. I do. <laughs> Right, good, bad, and otherwise. I've I've seen a lot of things over the days, and um, I think I really have a really um, comfortable knowledge of what's thriving or what will express itself in what way, depending varietally on site and exposure where it's grown. And then because I'm so compelled to blend, and my wines suit that kind of thing, that consistency comes from that deep knowledge of being in touch with your viticulture. So, you know, again, I've received a lot of flack over the years from the trade of, oh, you're not land-based, she was not land-based. It's like, you know, there's a lot of interactive um, knowledge and observation, 18 vintages of observation um, and feedback. So what may look like a disadvantage, I actually think is a true advantage. Um, so yeah. certainly was my circumstance. And I, I think I've definitely turned that circumstance into something that's worked for me as 
as a new world young winemaker, teaching myself how to make wine and delivered a really consistent product. And that's one of the things about the strength of the Joie brand is you reach for the Noble Blend. And yeah, the Noble Blend is definitely a vintage wine. It's going to express vintage. Mm -hmm. But I work really hard at making sure the Noble Blend tastes like Noble Blend. And that is harder than um, I think it looks like from the outside. So I think that's one of the hardest things in winemaking when you think about, um, you know, champagne houses and how the blenders have to make that champagne taste the same every year, with completely different vintage, blending all these wines, blending previous vintages. It's amazing. It's all about house style. So are you going to rib champagne for being consistent? I don't exactly. think so. I don't think so. <laughs> see a wine crime consistency exactly. is not a wine crime i think you can be consistent and still show vintage 100 exactly. that's that's my job <laughs> yes exactly exactly and you have your you know you can then decide you know fiddle around with your percentages of the grapes as well and there you know, is part of it. blended every year do i know when the noble blend is in balance sort of percentage wise definitely for that consistency sake but you know, I don't do that necessarily blending up through the fact anymore. I do it by picking in the vineyard at certain times. And that's master class. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. What is Joie's most popular wine? I would definitely have to say the rose. Well, it's really, really hard toss up between the Noble Blend and the Rosé. Um, Maybe the new bubbly. <laughs> um, I think for the trade, um, definitely the PTG, which is based off of another European country wine. So the likelihood of Joie basing its portfolio off of two proprietary small production <laughs> um, European country wines, the likelihood of success is that is low. Um, but what made them successful is, again, that natural sense of balance in those blending traditions. So that that. Pinot Noir Gamay blend um, is definitely a favorite of the restaurant trade, but I think the public has definitely uh, glommed onto the Noble Blend and Rosé. I think for the diehard wine geeks, um, the Muscat, the, the Moscato Giallo that's planted at Joa, anybody that's been to Joa, um, it's a really unique uh, varietal that I ferment dry in the Northern Italian style. So that's a, a deep geek Joa favorite um, for sure. Uh, I love this question. On the rare occasion that you have a can and you don't actually finish it, <laughs> how? What are the storage recommendations for okay. it? <laughs> so I often have open cans in my fridge just because. Um, yeah, so I cook with them. I, I add them to sauces. I balance. I finish soups with them. So because my wines are all so high acid, and say so you don't have a lemon kicking around, or you, finished your rice wine vinegar, just throw some tiny bubbles in there. <laughs> yeah, cook with it. Um, if you're a real enthusiast, um, I I have my own red wine um, mother, excuse me, a vinegar mother. So I often put my, excuse me, uh, wine heels into my vinegar um, mother. So you can keep, it's like, come like, it's like kombucha. You just keep her, keep her going. Oh, very cool. Great. So that's what you can do with your unopened cans. Uh, what else? They make great fruit fly traps. <laughs> Perfect. I still think it's highly likely you're not going to finish the can, but hey, you never know. You never know. Yeah, you can give it to your 11 year old to critique it, you know? Make exactly. <laughs> um, we did a variety pack for this um, event, of course, a virtual tasting, so we could sample three. Um, Heidi, are you selling a variety pack in stores? Yeah. So I don't know if everybody can see this well, but they arrived today. So we made a six pack fun ready variety pack of two Noble Blend, two Rosé and two Tiny Bubbles. Like you would pick up a six pack of beer, you could just put your fingers in there. I think it would be really fun for my retailers to merchandise. But really grab and go style, whether you, uh, you know, you order them and put them in your own fridge or you're picking them up cold out of everything wines fridge. Um, these are awesome to just throw in your cooler, take wherever you're going. Um, I'm pretty excited about them. And arriving in store shortly. Yeah. 
Amazing. Well, we're happy to carry them. Um, just in case this Teams meeting kicks us out, I do want to thank you both for your time today. This was just wonderful and uh, great learnings. Great to have you both. Great to have a celebration for International Women's Day as well and featuring um, our fantastic BC <laughs> winemaker here as well. Um, please visit OneGirlCan.com to learn more about this great organization. And of course, JoieFarm.com. And if you're going to Naramata, book a reservation for their tasting room, which opens up May 1st. And if you don't know Everything Wine, we have six locations, or you can shop online at everythingwine.ca. And if you both have a few more minutes or if there's any other questions, um, I think we're happy to go for a few more minutes. Just, uh, but if the thing, uh, Teams closes, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to get that in there just yeah, in case. It's, we're done. <laughs> hey, if anybody has, uh, I did promise some stories and I have some pretty funny anecdotes to share. You know, I never really think of myself uh, as a woman in wine. I, I'm just Heidi in wine, right? Really, at the end of the day, I've directed my career towards excellence in food and wine. I have, when these guys asked me to do this event, just in preparation of this conversation, I really put pen to paper and thought of some pretty hideous things that have happened to me in A Woman is Warm. Um, just things that... Uh, um, kind of compromise an underlying assumption of um, your credibility, your competence as a winemaker. I also come in a very unlikely package. I'm sitting, I look like Lady Heidi right now, but I'm five feet tall. So I can't literally five feet tall with my shoes on, work boots on. Um, I'm a pretty unassuming, powerful lady. And I think it takes people off guard sometimes. So some of my favorite stories, when I think back, favorite, not favorite stories, is I have been pat on the head in my own winery by fellow winery owners. Um, <laughs> total thumbs down. You know, you know, had to be removed by, by, you know, that person was removed from the winery uh, by, their, by their wife. Uh, that wasn't <laughs> It's always resonated with me ever since. Um, I bet there were some curse words in their car afterwards from his wife, but. I can yeah. imagine. Um, that never really sat well with me. And I have this thing about people patting me on the head because yeah, I'm five feet tall. Most people are, you know, and come in a cute package. People just have this compulsion to pat me on the head. So if you ever see me in public, don't pat me on the head. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> it happens. It's, it's so weird. Um, that is just so weird. <laughs> it happens. Um, I had, um, because I lease land, um, I have long standing leases that sometimes the property owners will change hands. And I had a particular property that I cherish, change hands, and a, a leasehold company took it to manage the lease. And so somebody came uh, to meet me when the property changed hands to continue on and renew the contract. And it was pretty serious real estate contract. It's 18 page legal lease. Don't fuck around with these things because I'm boss lady. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, um, uh, you know, they got out of their car, took one look at me again in my own winery and looked me up and the up down, not a sexy up down, but like the, and looked at me in the eye and said, you're not what I was expecting. Real talk. I was like, so, you know, I took that in from him. I'm like, well, sir, what were you expecting? Yeah. And I was, and I, he's, he just, you know, blank stare. And I was like, well, shall we do business? Would you like to see my winery? And that's what happened. We signed the lease, things carried on, but you know, that, that happened. Wow. <laughs> Um, back in the day when we had, we we're setting up the cooking school in very early 2000s, I deal with a lot of trades because wine making is indeed so industrial. And one of my introduction to Okanagan trades was calling a gas fitter to hook up the original stoves for the outside cooking school at Schwa. And the gas fitter arrived and he rang the doorbell of the old farmhouse. And he took one look at me again, the up down. And he's like, is your dad home? <laughs> well, okay, maybe it's a compliment because you look so young, but, um, <laughs> sure. God. yeah, so oh, these are, 
Yeah, these truly, I, I could go on. I'm not going to go on. I could tell you some real heinous stories from the kitchen, but you know, I never really think about these stories because you, you put those things in a special place and you carry on. You're like, fuck you. Let's just do this. But it's, it's, it's instances in events like this, when you get asked, so what's it like to be a woman in wine? And you're like, well, I'm a woman in wine. I'm, I make wine, I do the job. These are things that compel me and inspire me. And I'm more apt to talk about what inspires me. And uh, certainly I've tried to pass on those things. I, I'm a big believer in mentorship. I, I, I run a very pro-female business. Um, I love to inspire other other women in wine, not because they're women in wine, but because they deserve mentorship. And I seem to, I seem to offer a safe place for, I think, safe and inspiring place for women to learn about wine. It's not that I seek that out, they find me, but I think that's why they find me. But it's not until there's events like this, where you get asked the question, what's it like to be a woman in wine, where you're like, hmm, okay, I'm going to think about that real talk for a second. And when I think about these stories, and I talked about them with Sanjaya earlier in the week, it's like, that's, that's just not right, right? Like, they happened, I got on with it, they don't affect me necessarily day to day, they don't really inform my stance in the wine business, but that's bullshit. You know, like, those things aren't okay. No. Yeah. Great to talk exactly. about in forums like this. Um, Absolutely. And... You know, they're 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 great moments of pause to say we're we're just not done yet and we're just not there yet. So as much as I don't like being put in that corner or being defined as a woman in wine, it actually drives me crazy. It's it's questions like this. It's like, no, that Heidi, that shouldn't drive you crazy. That question is important. And um I, I that's why I was compelled to share those stories. You know, it wasn't clickbait. It wasn't any of that. Th those stories actually happened, and one of them quite recently. And um, it's just not okay. So, no. well, well, and I was just going to say, I was, I'm curious to see if it's better now for women because there are more women psalms, there are more women getting into wine, there are more winemakers for sure. But then you were just saying one of those ha uh, stories just happened recently. So clearly, it hasn't. I mean, it's probably changed and gotten a bit better, but still absolutely not there yet. That particular person and the story that happened recently was, um, there was no head padding the second time, but he, he did look at me, he's like, oh, you haven't gotten any bigger, have you? And it's just like, this person comes out of the lumber business. And yeah, I know the lumber business definitely has, you know, that culture attached to it, but that's not okay either. No, no. There have to be women in the wine business. These people have to have daughter, you know, do these people not have daughters? Exactly. And would you want somebody treating, saying that kind of thing to their daughter? That's not okay. No, no, it's, not okay. no. it's just yeah. respect, respectful, right? So exactly. And it, it's discrediting and, um, yeah, it's 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 events like these that are important. It's charities like that, these that are important. I think those things don't bother me because I'm a confident human. I, I'm very blessed to have been raised by a family that raised a confident woman. I was encouraged by my dad, by my education. And what I think is important about this charity is I think the thing that made me confident is twofold. I was told as a person, I could do anything that I wanted to do. And my education that I was very privileged to have, which is multifaceted, gave me the confidence to do that. So the one thing that I think that will break this cycle is raising confident women and raising sons and raising hum enlightened humans that just call bullshit on that because that's not cool. Exactly. Respectful to one another, shall we? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. So <laughs> cheers, cheers to that. Thank you. Cheers to that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But my wine supported everything. Wine supported the charity tonight. And thank yeah. you so much. Really appreciate both of you being here. This has just been an amazing event. And I can't thank you enough. And I can't thank you for all the participants as well for being with us and giving us your time on a Friday night. Enjoy your spring break. Enjoy your weekends, everyone. Exactly. <laughs> it's like 
Oh, what day is? Oh, it is Friday night. It is I know. Friday night. We lose All the time. days come the same. Absolutely. Exactly. And cheers to being able to gather in public. So have a safe weekend, everyone. Thank you so Thank much, you. Heidi. What is that? Hi, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both. So it was amazing.